you very much. It's a real pleasure to be back here uh, with all of you. So what I will try to do over the next few minutes is just give an update on the current, the uh, humanitarian consequences uh, across Mali um, of the most recent round of uh, military intervention, but also looking more broadly at, at some of the deeper issues as well. And, and to start with, let me, let me just go back in time to, uh, to about 2011 to talk about the chronic uh, food uh, crisis that was going on in Mali, uh, which underlies a lot of the humanitarian needs in Mali today. Uh, there was a drought uh, that uh, in 2011 that led to major shortfalls in food in 2012. We estimated at that time approximately 4 million people would be food insecure uh, in Mali. Uh, an additional um, uh, 175,000 children affected by severe acute malnutrition, uh, several hundred thousand by moderate acute malnutrition. Uh, and that was the initial impetus for, uh, for the humanitarian response in Mali and actually across the Sahel. And my own appointment was actually linked to that crisis more than what we see today in Mali. So it's important to keep in mind as we talk about the humanitarian consequences uh, that there is a broader crisis uh, that's still underway in, in Mali, and I'll talk about that in a little more detail. Then with the events in the north and the coup d'etat in March of last year, a new dimension was added to that with, uh, with the country essentially being divided into a northern and southern part, uh, causing a great deal of displacement, over 200,000 displaced internally, and an additional 150,000 uh, displaced as refugees, particularly in Niger, Burkina Faso, and in uh, Mauritania. Um, the latest round of, uh, of conflict that started with the uh, movement south of Mujao and Ansardine forces in January, which triggered a uh, intervention by French and now uh, uh, a broader international response into Mali, uh, has caused additional displacement, but not of the same order, not of the same magnitude as the original displacement. Approximately 30,000 more people have been uh, displaced uh, since that time, about 22,000 additional refugees, primarily going into uh, Mauritania, and around 14,000 uh, IDPs, so about 35, 36,000 additional people. Those numbers continue to rise uh, quite steadily, in fact. Uh, so uh, we're not quite sure where the displacement figures will, will end. Uh, so while not as important as the original displacement, it is uh, nonetheless having an increasing impact. Uh, 6,000 of those IDPs are actually along the Algerian border on the Malian side uh, who had hoped to get refuge in Algeria but have not been allowed to cross. So that's another, another factor. Uh, not surprisingly, they are coming from the Kidal region of, uh, of northern Mali. The other internally displaced tend to come from the regions of uh, Timbuktu and Gao. Um, now, where does this take us? I think <coughs> it's important to keep in mind the, m the relative magnitudes of the humanitarian needs in Mali. It's easy to forget in a conflict situation <coughs> like this the underlying humanitarian issues. 80% of the needs, uh, humanitarian needs, are actually in the south and central regions of Mali. Uh, so we have to continue to maintain that uh, support. Uh, but, what, but there are some very, very real challenges in working in the, in the north. The initial military intervention um, temporarily caused us to suspend operations, particularly in the Mopti, Segu, and Kai areas. Uh, but those have now been resumed, and we're, we're working our way uh, northwards uh, into Kona and Duanza now, and looking towards uh, Gao and Timbuktu in order to get humanitarian assistance uh, moving again. Prior to this last round of intervention, we had successfully uh, seen a number of NGOs working on the ground uh, with <coughs> food assistance coming through WFP, through uh, the river towards Timbuktu, uh, basically supporting the northwestern side of the country, and the ICRC uh, from NMA coming into Gao supporting the uh, more the northeast side. Um, the and additional medical supplies and other support also coming in along those same, same routes. 
the current intervention has actually changed those dynamics considerably. Uh, and of course, the, the north-south divide that we worked in previously no longer uh, really exists. But what we do have is, is an emerging situation that we've not yet fully adapted to, but we'll need to, to do so uh, relatively quickly. Uh, currently, uh, very little assistance is actually going into the three northern regions. Uh, and I'll explain the kinds of constraints that are face we're faced with at this point in time. It has not yet reached a critical stage uh, in the sense that there are adequate food supplies and other supplies probably for another two to three weeks in, in towards the end of this month, basically. Um, but we need to use this window uh, effectively to really uh, jumpstart jump start the assistance going in. The World Food Program has been able to start uh, distribution on the river uh, uh, towards Timbuktu and, and, and beyond, uh, but there are still a, a few other constraints that are problematic. Number one is the, the, the use of IEDs, particularly on the Duanza, actually it's between Gossi and Gao, um, uh, areas on the, on the principal road leading to Gao. There have been a couple of incidents already, uh, as, as there has been an incident outside of Kidal. So that's one issue uh, that is uh, 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 basically hindering access. The uh, major bridge between Niamey and Gao was partially destroyed uh, during uh, uh, by one of the, uh, by Mujiao, in fact, uh, in the early stages of this current round of conflict, which may also have an impact on, on access. The second issue are, are continued reports of restriction by Malian uh, security forces on the movement north of transport. Uh, the World Food Program and others are working to try to overcome that, but that, that is still a constraint. However, as I mentioned earlier, the use of the river has helped in uh, offset that to, to a certain degree. But the major issue really is the continued concern over security. A number of NGOs remain present on the ground in all of the major, all the three regions of the north, primarily through use of, of Malian uh, national staff, but also some internationals, uh, particularly those from the region, continue to be able to operate there. Uh, and that's a base from which we can, we can work with. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's important that we get this access in as short a time as possible to avoid any breakdown in the support going there. In addition to restrictions <coughs> on humanitarian assistance, it's very difficult for commercial supplies also to get there, which of course compounds the problem. Uh, the border with Algeria has been closed, at least formally, which has restricted considerably the flow of uh, food, commodities, and, and other commodities from, from the north. And of course, the transport issues I've described uh, coming from the south are, are equally restrictive. Um, so uh, there's a need for commercial access to also uh, resume if uh, to offset the p possibility of a greater crisis in the north. A second, <coughs> excuse me, a second issue for which I think access is important beyond just humanitarian um, uh, assistance is the issue of protection. There have been a number of credible reports of human rights abuses on both sides, uh, both by Malian security forces as well as by uh, Mujao and Sardine uh, um, groups on the ground. Um, there's a need to get uh, partners, humanitarian partners on the ground because in part that provides some protection through presence. Um, also to get human rights monitors on the ground uh, and that's required both to, to gather the facts of what has happened, um, uh, in part to, to, if there are uh, actual abuses identified, that appropriate action can be pursued. But also we know in such situations some reports can be exaggerated and there's a danger with exaggerated reports uh, inciting violence elsewhere. So it's important that the truth of what's going on actually get out. And uh, as long as there's a vacuum of knowledge, it can create conditions for, for reprisals. So it's important that th that capacity be also put in place and have the kind of access required. Looking forward, and I'll just wrap up because I think I'm running out of my mm. 10 minutes, is uh, looking forward, I think what will be required on the ground mm. uh, as we go forward, we need to be prepared for a very dynamic situation across Mali, um, not just in the north, uh, though the north will be of particular concern. We're seeing the start 
in and around Gao of, uh, of uh, asymmetrical conflict uh, with uh, the attack on Gao Town yesterday, uh, some suicide uh, uh, attacks uh, on checkpoints uh, north of Gao. Uh, these are all signals, uh, as, as well as the IEDs that have been laid on the road to Gao. All of these are signs that, at least on the Mujiao side, that things are, 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 are could be very problematic. So we need to be prepared to deal with that kind of situation, not only in Gao, but other parts of the country that may be affected either by uh, these types of attack, a terrorist attack, kidnappings uh, could <coughs> potentially resume. Uh, all of these are, are potential threats. Uh, what we need are not so much investments in heavy security in terms of escorts and uh, armored vehicles, but investments in getting a better situational <coughs> understanding of what's going on because that will give us greater, uh, I think, confidence on where we can operate, when we can operate, uh, which will allow us to be more uh, forward-leading in our ability to deliver humanitarian assistance. We will need to find creative ways to access. I know the World Food Program is looking, uh, in addition to overland by road or by, by, by boat, uh, air transport to, to bring in food if that's required, uh, uh, if access is not possible otherwise. So all of these elements, whether it's enhanced security support, situational awareness, uh, uh, multiple uh, logistics options for accessing different parts of Mali will be required to be put in place in the weeks ahead if we were to actually confront uh, successfully the humanitarian challenges that remain. Uh, just as a summary, for I didn't say this at the beginning, I should have, we do expect a total of two million people to be food insecure in Mali and in uh, 2013, half a million in the north, the rest uh, in the south. Over 200,000 children this year uh, affected by severe acute malnutrition, actually a higher figure than last year, a result of the complications of the continued food insecurity as well as the uh, conflict and displacement. There will need to be a focus on support to hum host communities, both for the displaced families, often they host um, they host 10, 20 or more people uh, in various parts of Mali, which is an extreme burden for them. The same is true for refugees uh, who are hosted by communities that are also affected by the recent uh, uh, drought uh, and putting a, a very heavy pressure on, on areas, particularly in Mauritania, <coughs> that don't have a uh, high capacity to support the numbers that are, that are coming in. So uh, a balanced approach. We may also have to work with both people that are continuing to be displaced, as we see, uh, but we cannot underestimate the possibility that people will also start to return home. So we may have to, to simultaneously support those who feel comfortable going back home while supporting those that are displaced because they feel now that the situation is such that they're no longer secure in their homes. And maybe we can talk about that in more detail. Final note on all of this, uh, ultimately, if we want to avoid uh, repeat of the kind of humanitarian crisis we see across Mali. Uh, it's important that the, t the two political, primary political issues in Mali be sorted appropriately. One, of course, is the conflict with the North and, and the work with, the, with those Northern communities so that they're fully absorbed in, in a, in a, in a <coughs> long-term way into a Malian state uh, that's acceptable to, to, to all. And secondly, is an appropriate political transition in, in, the, in the whole of Mali that leads to a more, um, more uh, uh, stabilized uh, government in, in Mali itself. And both need to be dealt with. It's not just a north-south issue. Likewise, on the development, it's not just a question of stabilization in the north of Mali. There is also a need to address the chronic food nutrition issues, which are in part a reflection of inequitable investment across Mali, and not just in the north, that there needs to be a balanced, uh, equitable uh, <coughs> development strategy put in place that uh, truly uh, supports appropriately uh, all people in, in Mali if we're to avoid the kinds of crises we, we currently see. Uh, in, in fact, in many ways, what we see in Mali is both the humanitarian consequences are, are really the result of both a political failure and a development failure and the combination is a very, very uh, nasty combination. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David.